introduce our illustrious panel. Uh, to my right is Jerome Guillon, the former Vice President of Worldwide Sales and Service for Tesla Motors. Stefan Knupfer, Senior Partner at McKinsey and the Lead on Sustainability. And Margot Ogay, former Director for the Office of Transportation and Air Quality at the EPA. Thank you all for being here. As is evidenced by the rather futuristic and absolutely fantastic BMW i8 hybrid supercar sitting outside, and I hope you've all taken the chance to drive it, uh, how we get from point A to point B is radically shifting. And that's, of course, in part due to things like climate change and urban expansion around the globe. And this brings to us all of these new solutions, smart mobility, connectivity, ride sharing, autonomous vehicles, Stefan, I'm going to start with you. I know that yesterday McKinsey and you released a, mo a mobility study. How do you look at all of these new technologies and solutions, prioritize them? Which of them will matter? So um, based on the study that we released yesterday, exactly as you said, it's called urban mobility at a tipping point. Um, we do believe that at this point right now, if you are um, a member of a large city, the biggest thing that you want to do in cities is obviously moving around from a point A to point B, which is a, a question of freedom. Um, if you do so, you face a lot of congestions, traffic, and also pollution. If you think about the future development where you have about two and a half billion more middle class citizens, majority of them in cities, you can imagine if we do exactly the same. What's going to happen is obviously we have more congestion, more pollution. The good thing is that there is new technology, just uh, connectivity in a car, autonomous driving, e-hailing, e also the electrical vehicle, the electrical drive. All of them combined in a city can actually make a big difference and can make driving and moving around, to be quite honest, from point A to B much more interesting and more efficient, faster, and actually more cost effective in the future. Jerome, Tesla was not your first alternative vehicle rodeo. You've got a lot of experience in this world. What do you look at as the, the correct solutions for urban mobility issues? Well, there are different solutions. You know, right here in Austin, actually, I founded Car2Go, uh, which I believe now is the largest car sharing company in the world. Uh, and that was a part of uh, a series of initiatives that I was leading at Daimler when I was working at Daimler about thinking about uh, new business models, new innovation, and uh, in particular, uh, trying to increase the asset utilization. There are so many cars that are used in average one hour per day. Uh, that's not a very good use of an asset. So uh, we started Car2Go, first in Europe, and then moved it in the US here in Austin uh, to try to increase this. And uh, as you can probably see through all the little cars zipping around, uh, in uh, Austin, it's uh, worked quite well, uh, so I'm quite successful with that, yeah. Margot, you have stated something rather radical, that the CAFE goal for 2025 of 54 miles per gallon average fuel economy isn't anywhere near enough, that the world has to be populated with only zero emissions vehicles. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Well, first of all, I want to say th thank you for having me. I think this is a fantastic conference. And I think we want to have more conferences like this with cars, more car time given Amen. to this conference. Yeah. Uh, you know, yesterday I was listening to the first panel about uh, what's going on in Washington, and there was a lot of um, depressed people talking about D.C. And, and I'm depressed. You know, I live in this area for 32 years worked for the government for 32 years, and clearly we have a very dysfunctional Congress. But what was missed yesterday in this discussion was there are some things that are working. And I just briefly want to say what, what has worked the last five years and the effect it has had for mobility and, and personal mobility and cars. The first thing that it works is that President Obama is using his executive authority, and he has done that when it came to climate change because Congress was not willing to act. The second is that we have a wonderful tool, it's called the Clean Air Act, that at least when it comes to the transportation sector, it has worked. Uh, amazing, 2010 and then 2012 under President Obama, and I was in charge of that program, which resulted, my book, Driving the Future, you guys can get a copy, it's outside, in a program that is fantastic. 
By 2025, we're going to reduce carbon pollution from new cars by half, 160 grams per mile. And we're going to double the fuel economy to 54.5. And all that, with pretty much all the major OEMs signing a piece of paper with President Obama, has never happened before in the history of air pollution and regulations, basically saying, yes, we can do it. Yes, we can. And as a result, what do we have today? We have an industry that is, is doing extraordinarily well. We have, third, back 15 years ago, we had two hybrid vehicles, two advanced powertrain models. Today, we have over 76, from plug-in hybrids to electrics to um, even fuel cells in part of the country and hybrids. So this is all fantastic. But if we're going to look at climate change and what we need to do, based on the scientific community by 2050, what they're telling us we have to do is that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% from 2005 levels. This is from all sectors, it's not just the US, it's globally. So what, is, what does that mean for cars? I mean, let's assume that cars will have to do the same as far as reducing the carbon footprint. So for cars by 2050, every car on the road in the US, not new cars, have to be 180 miles per gallon, fueled with renewable sources, and it really has to be zero emitting vehicle, which means really no more fossil fuels powering those cars. So that's a, that's a huge challenge. But I'm an optimist by nature, and I think it's gonna happen. And there are three trends very briefly I wanna talk about, which I think they're very consistent with what I heard from you, uh, and I talk about them in, in, in my book. The first thing is that the good news is, is that there are global efforts to reduce emissions from cars and improve the fuel efficiency. That's the converging of climate change regulations for cars. Across the planet, 70% of all new cars sold across the planet have some form of a requirement, either for improving the fuel economy, reducing the carbon footprint of cars. And by 2020 and 2025, those requirements converge, which is fantastic. So it's not just the US that is pushing the envelope for more advanced powertrain and cleaner, low carbon uh, polluted vehicles. It's across the planet. I just came back from China on Friday, uh, and I can tell you very briefly that they are very serious when it comes to electric powertrain. This year they're gonna sell more electric cars than the US as a whole. And, and in major cities, you cannot own a car. You know, one out of 100 people can get the ability to have a car, but if you buy an electric car, you probably can drive that car on major cities. So, so the converging of, of climate change regulations for cars is a very important trend that will continue. The second is the growth of mega cities and urban environments. 70% of greenhouse gas emissions come from those environments and cities. That reflects 50% of the population and only 2% of the land. And as we heard, we're gonna add another 2 billion people in the planet from now to 2050. And there is absolutely no way that the developing countries, India and China, can have the same platform as we have for personal mobility in the West world. Well, that's, that's a great point. And, and Stefan, I think I'd like you to speak to that. How do you educate, how do you convince a consumer that they want to give up their personal freedom, that choice of entering the middle class and no longer using a car for transportation, but as a status symbol as well. So to be quite honest, um, interesting enough, many of those consumers you do not have to convince. They are already convinced because if you look at a lot of those offerings out there right now, um, they are very much actually very quickly growing. The consumers accept them. So, which means on the other side, you have very different starting points in different cities. So if you look at the Western Hemisphere, the North America and Western Europe, um, if you look at the younger generation, they don't necessarily care so much about cars than my generation actually did. On the other side, if you go more to Asia and, and China, if you, for the first time, you're entering the middle class, you have the money to buy a car, you wanna buy a car. 
and therefore it's a more a status symbol. So therefore, I don't think you, you have to actually make very much sure kind of where you will be and what starting point individual cities have. I also believe that the cities will be thriving for all the reasons you just mentioned, Margaret, will be thriving those kind of developments. And before we always <coughs> talked about regions, so it has to be the Northeast, or it has to be Western Europe, or something like this. Very honestly, I do believe the cities by themselves could actually drive these, these kind of developments. And the combination of those different offerings, from, as I mentioned, from moving from point A to B, where you have e-hauling, um, where you obviously have public transportation, where you have your individual car, where you have car sharing, all those different things, giving with the, just the connectivity helps you to be on point, so you're not waiting. So you know exactly you have a liability, a reliability, sorry, a reliability that the car really shows up, and that actually makes a big difference already. Jerome, it's probably safe to say you're rather <laughs> bullish on electric. Um, what do you see across the world in terms of other solutions being applicable to various cities, countries? Um, well, electric is, is progressing, uh, unfortunately, slower than we had anticipated. Uh, the Model X is out today. Yeah. <laughs> later tonight, right? Uh, the, um, you know, it's Tesla's mission to accelerate uh, the transition to sustainable transportation, but uh, uh, even this year, trying to deliver 50,000, 55,000 car, in a global market of 70 million, it's really a tiny, tiny little drop in a big bucket. Uh, so uh, trying to act as a role model for others, and I'm actually quite proud to see the BMW efforts uh, uh, with the i3 and the i8, and uh, <coughs> definitely stunning vehicles uh, uh, to look at. Um, and uh, uh, it's, so it's encouraging to see this effort, but I wish it was even faster uh, on, on many levels, yeah. Um, so one of the solutions that I hear from all of you is obviously going to go away would be fossil fuel-based solutions. Dare I say diesel in today? Uh, let's let's talk well, about that, that a little bit. I think diesel for long haul track, trucking is pretty good. So uh, it would be difficult to displace that, you know, for 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 uh, long truck big uh, long haul big trucks. Yeah. For for passenger vehicles, what is what is the long term future for for gasoline and diesel? Do you? Have a feeling about that, Margot? So, so me, me. Yes, you know, um, clearly diesel has been the fuel that has been used to power commercial trucks, locomotives, uh, marine engines. And the reason for that is it's a very durable engine and it offers much more significant fuel economy benefits, at least 20% <laughs> better than an equivalent gasoline engine. But when it came to cars, the last time we saw a car in the U.S. was in the mid-80s with General Motors. I don't know if anybody's from GM. That was an awful car. I mean, diesel cars as a whole were just awful, awful cars back in those days. You know, they were smelling, they were noisy, just not fun to drive. But in Europe, because of the taxation of, of fuel, uh, diesel became the fuel for cars, not just for trucks and commercial, you know, engines. So what ended up in Europe is 50% of the cars are diesel cars. Um, and they have improved a lot, better torque, better performance, clearly better fuel efficiency. And in the US, diesel cars could not come to the US because they could not meet the environmental standards that we set at EPA and, and the state of California. Until 2004, 2005 timeframe, when we required the oil industry to reduce sulfur levels in diesel, and you saw the reemergence of diesel cars, and you've been very successful. So I think, in my view, diesel still has a role to play. Uh, and the biggest issue is not competing with gasoline, but just competing with hybrids. At some point, people are going to say, do I really want to buy the diesel because of better fuel economy just instead of getting a hybrid or electric? <laughs> OK. Um, we're going to open this up to questions in just a second, so prepare. Um, Can I say something still about the diesel? Yes, okay, please. Good. Um, on the diesel, I very honestly, I believe it's too early to kind of say goodbye to the diesel because we obviously know all the things that are happening right now. Um, I think we just have to wait how the technology plays out. There is one thing which is relatively clear. We will see more and more electrification. I think there is no doubt about it in all different kinds of forms. Therefore, it goes definitely in the direction that Margaret and Jerome are describing. 
there will be a transition period because honestly not everybody can afford right now a battery of the size in every small little car. So therefore we will rely for some time on some kind of combustion engine. If diesel actually is not as good as we all thought it would be, it will change the game significantly and we will need to find other solutions to get to the fuel efficient standards and things like this. But from my understanding, this is too early at this point right now that we kind of say the technology doesn't work. No, and, and can I say something? The technology does work. I mean, we're talking about an, uh, a name company, unfortunately, that did not put the technology as they should have to make the diesel clean. But the technology does work. I think the challenge for diesel is it is for, for gasoline engines is can they continue to compete in the marketplace when we're going towards zero emitting vehicles? So in my view, pure gasoline hybrids and diesels are really the interim step for the next 10 years, but we have to be moving to electrification. Thank you. Questions? It's very hard to see. In the back there. Hi, Brian Lebo with Hitachi. So the more uh, electric vehicles work best in urban environments, but the more urban your environment, the less likely you are to have the personal infrastructure for charging an electric vehicle. What's the solution to that mismatch of sort of application and infrastructure? Uh, first of all, electric vehicles work everywhere. It's not for urban, you know. I'm on vacation at the moment. I drove from Southern France to Norway and back. That's not urban. I just drove all the way on the West Coast with a Tesla. It also, you know, it's fine. You can drive everywhere. You know, people go to the North Cape, you know. I think uh, the conception that electric vehicle is only for short distance is a wrong one, yeah. And by the way, there are outlets everywhere. There are many more outlets available anywhere to charge a car than there are uh, uh, gas stations. So charging is not an issue. I, I would also like to say it's probably a question of time. I would agree with you that probably you will get faster um, penetration of charging in electrical driving, even short distance driving in city centers and urban um, area, but it's only a question about the infrastructure, which, by the way, if the right yeah. technology, it is just a quest question of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also, I think you see right now, I think our challenge is probably that we don't have enough attractive products out there of electrical vehicles at this point to really penetrate the market more. Um, but the ones actually, if you look at the owners of electrical vehicles, nobody, nobody complains about not having enough charging stations, mm -hmm. really. So they all kind of live with it because they enjoy driving the electrical vehicle. So I think it's a question over time. Yeah. Uh, there was a recent study that came out a couple of weeks ago by the International Council for Clean Transportation. Um, and they, look, they took a look at 25 cities across the country. Uh, and what they found out is that the major cities, the urban environments, there were seven cities in that study, they reflect something like more sales, you know, so even, you know, setting Los Angeles aside or part of California than the rest of the country. So, so yeah, because, you know, that's where electric cars are being sold for the most part. So I agree with you that infrastructure is an issue. I drive an electric car. I live outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, it's, it, for me, it's easy. I plug it in, uh, you know, in my house. If I go to the airport, I find a space that I can plug it in. I go to the major supermarkets, you know, they have plug-in stations. So I think right now we have about 10,000 uh, electric charges across the country, and it's moving very fast. So between that, along with the ability to have batteries that, that charge faster, uh, and eventually having on-demand electric cars or share, uh, which is the way that things are going to go. Uh, I, I'm very bullish and very hopeful that we're, we're going to get there. I live in a townhouse. I can't charge my electric car at night. Uh, I'm sure that there are plenty of places to charge, yeah. but do you think electric cars are going to be practical for people who simply don't have a garage and can't charge at home? Uh, let me say this. My daughter lives outside of Los Angeles, a place called Thousand Oaks. She lives in a townhouse. Uh, but what they have done is they have, you know, put together, they got together as a community, put parking spaces. So her and her husband have electric cars and they are able to, to, to plug in. Uh, so talk to your community, get together, have a voice. It cannot all be based on the government. I mean, we have to participate, and that's how things happen. I'm curious, just um, we'll take your question over here in just a second. Um, how many people in the audience drive a hybrid or all pure electric vehicle? 
in just pure electric? And Teslas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have actually a combustion car as well with a combustion engine in addition to your electrical vehicle? Because I think that's a trust, obviously, still, I believe, the charging issue that at least is in some people's mind or not. Mm -hmm. um, so most people at this point right now, um, they have actually uh, several vehicles, at least more than one. That's at least when you look at the adaption. Um, I'm for myself actually have an electrical vehicle, a diesel, and I have some classic cars that I will not give up. So I do believe it's going to be the whole variety of it. <laughs> I like him. <laughs> There's a question over here. Good morning. This is Tom Grossi with Hitachi. Um, your thoughts and projections about hydrogen vehicles, please. Good question. So, um, you know, I always question um, companies like Toyota, why are you doing, you know, why are you spending so many resources on fuel cells? Uh, and I was telling Sue, I'm on the advisory board for the, for the Secretary of the Department of, Transport, of, 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 of Energy, uh, advising them how to move forward with their fuel cell and hydrogen programs. You know, clearly, right, in my view, this is my personal view, uh, we need to have competition for zero emitting vehicles. So we have pure electric powertrain based on battery and electric motor. Fuel cells, in my view, can still be viewed as an option for certain parts of the planet. It doesn't have to be everywhere. We know Japan is very much committed to fuel cells and they're making it happen. We know California is. The biggest issue that I have, there are two issues that I have with, with fuel cells. One is infrastructure. Um, you know, we have, I think, I don't know, 80 or 100 uh, stations across the country, most of them in California. But the second and most important is that even the infrastructure that we're talking about, we're talking about natural gas that reforms the gas into hydrogen. So it's not really renewable. The hope with electric cars is that eventually you're going to have an energy sector that will be based mostly on renewable sources and you will have, you know, zero, indeed zero emitting vehicles. So there are challenges. The cost has come down tremendously. Uh, these cars uh, are fantastic. I have driven them. Uh, so we just have to wait and see how they're going to pan out. And for a company like Toyota being so seriously involved in investing, uh, you need to, we need to take a pause and, 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 and see how it's going to evolve. Do you have quick last thoughts on fuel cells, Jerome? You're nodding. Um, it's better than I passed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody referred to them as full cells, I believe. Yeah, so. Ah, nice. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and on that happy note, <laughs> I want to thank our panelists. We are out of time. Thank you all. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully to do this again. Thank you.